For oral questions, I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Housing starts are down. Targets are apparently out of reach for this government, and the crisis is getting worse than ever. We did what the government won't do. We put a real housing plan on the table, a plan that would double the supply of permanently affordable homes by working with non-market providers. Instead of supporting our motion and rolling up their sleeves and taking an all-hands-on-deck approach, this government said no. So, Speaker, why is it that when it comes to lobbyists and insiders and conservative donors, the answer is always yes, but when it comes to the basic needs of Ontarians, this Premier always says no? Reply. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What uh, we voted against yesterday was a tired old plan that failed and continues to fail uh, the people of the province of Ontario. This is something that the NDP tried when they were in government between 1990 and 1995, which was a spectacular fail failure, Mr. Speaker. Now, to make matters even worse, it is very similar to a plan that the federal Liberals have in place, and it is about it is about ideology and talking about housing, but not actually getting shovels in the ground, Mr. Speaker. Now, if the NDP and the Liberals spent uh, some time actually contemplating the issues as opposed to writing about it and talking about it, that they would know. They would know, Mr. Speaker, that we have introduced a new provincial planning statement, which is housing positive, which unleashes housing uh, along our transit routes in cooperation with the Minister of Infrastructure, who is bringing forward transit-oriented communities. But what it really reflects on, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that interest rates increase so quickly, so fast, because of the high inflation policies Bonds. of the federal, liberal and NDP government, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that is what has caused a pause in what was record-setting pace of building homes across the province of Ontario. The supplementary question. Speaker, talk about ideology, right? Here's what happens in Ontario today. The Premier cuts deals, insiders cash in, and regular Ontarians pay the price every single time. There's always time and money for schemes like a $100 billion tunnel to nowhere and luxury spas in downtown Toronto. But investing in housing that people can actually afford they can't even imagine it. Is it any surprise that Ontarians can't find affordable housing today? It's not being built. Sitting back and waiting for the homes to magically appear is not working. So is this Premier just waiting for a miracle? Why won't you consider public investment to make up the difference? Where do they think that homes are going to come from? Either way, there. Thanks. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, listen, I, I watched uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition's uh, press conference with respect to her, her, her policy. She was asked three times what would the policy cost, and three times she avoided the answer because she didn't know. It reminds me of their election platform. Remember the last election platform? They had this massive hole in spending, uh, I think it was what? $7 billion, Mr. Speaker. That's Liberal and NDP math, right? What they're contemplating, Mr. Speaker, is by our calculations, a over $150 billion program that will create Order. literally no homes, Mr. Speaker. Instead, what we're doing, instead what we're doing is we're building infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, so that we can unleash not hundreds of homes, not thousands of homes, but millions of homes for the people of the province of Ontario. We invest over $1.2 billion Spons. a year across the province of Ontario in subsidized housing, Mr. Speaker. We've removed uh, development charges on affordable affordable housing. I remind the Leader of the Opposition that she and her party voted against that. That policy unleashed hundreds of thousands. Thank you. Thank you very much. The final supplementary. Sir, I don't know what this uh, minister and this government expect. I think people are going to live in the tunnel. I mean, come on. Where are the homes? Where are they? You're not building them. People can't afford them anymore. Two and a half years ago, Order. the government's own housing affordability task force laid it all out, right? They said to Order. build one and a half million homes, we need fourplexes. We need density near transit. We need non-market housing. But since then, what have we got? Scandals, excuses, wasted time, wasted money. 
even with all of their attempts to pad the numbers, Speaker, for housing counts, this government is nowhere near close enough, and all you have to do is read their fall economic statement. People in Ontario cannot afford to wait any longer. They cannot afford this Conservative government Question. any longer. So if the Premier can't get the job done, isn't it time he got out of the way and let those of us who actually have a housing plan get it built? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, order. Speaker, Speaker, uh, look, if the Leader of the Opposition wants to go to the people of the province of Ontario and ask them for a mandate, I welcome it, Mr. Speaker, because I will put the record of this government, I will put the record of this government on the table any day, Mr. Speaker. We were building homes at a record pace across the province of Ontario. They sure. stood in the way each and every time, Mr. Speaker. Well, we were bringing automotive investments to the tune of $45 billion. They were voting against it, Mr. Speaker. We were building transit and transportation. They couldn't get it done. We are building it across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're unleashing opportunity in northern Ontario. We're connecting the minerals of the north and the wealth of the north to the prosperity and manufacturing Spons. might of the South, Mr. Speaker. We're building our hospitals. We're educating our students better, Mr. Speaker. We're balancing the budget. We're getting the job done. You want an election? Bring it on. I know the people... Stop the clock. Stop the clock. And I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Government side will come to order. <laughs> Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development will come to order. The Associate Minister of Small Business will come to order. The Government House Leader will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, so let's talk about this government's record, shall we? This question again is going to go to the Premier. One year ago, when this government got caught trying to sell off the Greenbelt to insiders, they promised to review the Lobbyist Registration Act. That was after the Integrity Commissioner revealed an unregistered lobbyist was handing out Raptors tickets and rounds of golf, and after staffers were found using personal emails to communicate with insiders and lobbyists. Yet here we are, no review, no accountability, and former staffers like Ryan Amato are flat out refusing to comply with FOI requests. So, Speaker, my question again to the Premier is, is flouting integrity rules just business as usual for this government? And to respond, the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm actually happy for the opportunity to report that we are making progress on the review of the Lobbying Act. Uh, met with the Integrity Commissioner this summer. We've received uh, some of his ideas. We're waiting on, on some more, and, and I hope to close the loop on some of that uh, before he retires. And I have to tell you, he has done an absolutely excellent job, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and I welcome the opportunity to say, to say thank you uh, to the Integrity Commissioner, to Commissioner Wake, for the, for the tremendous work that he's done. Uh, he's held up his office to a high standard, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and I'll say more about the review in the second question, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Yes, we also appreciate the Integrity Commissioner, and we have kept him quite busy this year with complaints about this government. Speaker, the government claims zero tolerance for wrongdoing, and yet they haven't lifted a finger to prevent it from happening again. By law, the Lobbyist Registration Act was actually up for review in 2021. That's three years ago. But this government blew right past that deadline. And meanwhile, lobbyists and insiders are calling the shots, right? They're snapping up MZOs. They're gouging hospitals for private staffing companies. And they're bulldozing Ontario Place for a luxury spa. So my question to the Premier is, when are you going to follow through on tightening the lobbying rules, or are the perks and the massages just too good to pass up. Oh. 
the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and, and again, I, I want to speak more about the review of the Lobbying Act. And while the Leader of the Opposition is tilting at windmills and keeping them busy with frivolous in inquiries, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you this. I can tell you this, Mr. Speaker. When, when, the, re when the review is, is brought forward, Mr. Speaker, it will, it will last well beyond any of us in this place. It will be a solid piece of reform, Mr. Speaker, that will endure and set a standard uh, that, that is even tighter than what we have, Mr. Speaker. It is it's a great opportunity to move forward, uh, and, and I know that she's, she's bridging over to all sorts of other things that, that upset her about the progress we're making in this great province, Mr. Speaker, expanding jobs and investments in, in Ontario Place and all of the great things that we're doing for the people of Ontario. And, you know, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know if there's a third question in there. She's just going to talk more about the things that are Response? Upset, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Final supplement. Speaker, a million people went to a food bank last year. You're doing great things. The government was cautioned repeatedly that bad actors are taking advantage of the system because this government has allowed it to happen. The Conservatives have talked a very big game, saying it would root out the bad actors, the bad actor lobbyists. They said they would introduce new penalties for breaching the Act. The Premier even suggested jail time. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. But they were never serious about strengthening that lobbying act and the integrity laws. And I'm going to make this very simple for the Premier because he only has two options. Will he protect the public by fixing the Lobbyist Registration Act or will he continue to protect his lobbyist friends? Members will please take their seat. A member for Brantford Brant and Parliament. Uh, speaker, as has been mentioned by the Attorney General, uh, we are following the recommendation from the Auditor General and we are getting that done. And while our government expects all lobbyists to follow the current rules, it is clear that a few bad actors have taken advantage of the system. Speaker, our government will not tolerate this type of behaviour. And while public advocacy plays an important role in our democratic system, it must be done in an ethical and transparent manner. Anyone doing advocacy work with the government must be held to the highest standards. We will not tolerate anyone putting themselves above the trust, transparency and accountability of the people of Ontario. Order. There is no place in Ontario for this government for bad actors. Order. And these practices must be and will be put to an end. But, Speaker, Response. rather than be by, distracted by this, we will continue to build Ontario. We will get it done. Thank you, Speaker. Live from the fourth row. And the next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, uh, thank you very much. Um, back to the Premier. Over two and a half million people in Ontario don't have access to primary care right now. The current shortage of family doctors means the number of unattached patients is going to double in the next few years. That's 4.4 million people, or one in four Ontarians by 2026. Let that sink in. Nurse practitioners who have joined us in the House today are ready to fill the gap. They are trained to perform absolutely crucial work to address this health care crisis. But your government hasn't addressed their wages in years. And now that funding gap between nurse practitioners who work in hospitals and nurse practitioners who work in the community and in home care has become an ocean. Why won't this government pay nurse practitioners what they're owed, regardless of where they work? Members will please take their seats. Member for Essex and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Order. Speaker, thank you. Let me take an opportunity to praise the nurse practitioners who are here today and across the province of Ontario. Order for their very valuable contribution to the delivery of primary care. I take particular note, Mr. Speaker, that when uh, Liberals and NDPers talk about primary care, they never include the statistics in their statistics, the contribution that is made by nurse practitioners. But we include them in our statistics. When we deliver primary care in the province of Ontario, we know that 90, approximately 90 percent of everybody in the province of Ontario has primary care, part of which is delivered by nurse practitioners. We've 
we've funded the largest expansion of nurse practitioner care in the history Response. of the province of Ontario, and we continue to make progress and do more. Thank you very much. Supplementary question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Nurse practitioners want to work. They want to help solve the crisis in our health care system, and many of them cannot find a job. How could it be that with 2.5 million Ontarians without access to primary care, we have underemployed nurse practitioners right here, right now in Ontario, even in my riding in north, rural northern Ontario? Let this sink in. We have nurse practitioners willing and able to care for unattached, frail elderly with kids with complex medical need, keep them out of the emergency room, yet this minister refuses to fund them. With the millions of dollars over three years that promised was the solution, those nurse practitioners would not have come from all over Ontario to be here today. Oh, yeah. What is the minister waiting for? Member for Essex. Speaker, this government has undertaken the largest expansion of nurse practitioner service in the history of the province of Ontario. And as part of that expansion, let me talk about the Lakehead Nurse Practitioner-led clinic, which has an additional 1,600 patient spaces. That's another 1,600 individuals that will get service in and around the area of that nurse practitioner-led clinic. And that's thanks to the grand expansion of those services undertaken by this government because on this side we believe in patient-focused, team-based care. We're going to continue pursuing that and that's why we have appointed Jane Philpott, a recognized expert in primary care, to help us reach even better goals even though we're reaching a approximately 90 percent of all the residents in the province of Ontario. Response. We want to do better and we're going to do better and that's why we've appointed Jane Philpott to assist us in that goal. Thank you. Member for Hamilton West and Castro Dundas will come to order. Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Member for Windsor West will come to order. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Across the province, we are seeing companies invest, expand, and create great paying jobs. And that's what happens when you cut red tape and ensure the conditions are there for businesses to thrive. It is a direct contrast from the previous Liberal government who actively implemented policies that they knew would crush businesses and drive workers out of this province. But this is a new area, era for Ontario. Companies from across Ontario, the world, they know that there is no better place to do business and invest than right here in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please provide this House with an update on new investments and expansions that are happening right now here in Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, the economic developers who are here today know that every single night Premier Ford gets his text about yet another company investing in Ontario. Last week alone, Ontario landed more than $1 billion in private company investments, adding more than 2,300 jobs. Speaker, that, in that number was Moderna's expansion in Cambridge. Their multi-million dollar investment allowed them to partner with Novacol Pharma to add a new fill and finish line for mRNA vaccines. Now that will create more good paying jobs in Cambridge and in the surrounding area. And thanks to the great work from our economic development folks who are here today, we're seeing more investments flow into the province at an unprecedented rate. And that's why Hi, Speaker, 860,000 jobs were created in Ontario last since we were elected. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. We're seeing companies make job-creating investments in every sector in our, of our economy. Communities that the previous Liberal government turned their backs on are seeing the local economies flourish. That's what happened when you lower the cost of doing business and you get rid of red tape that the Liberals put up to stifle business, investments and job creation. 
Our life sciences sector is growing rapidly, and Moderna's investment is just a yet another vote of confidence in Ontario. We are everything that life science companies are looking for right here when they evaluate where they should expand. Most importantly, we are the home to the best talent in the world, with over 70,000 STEM students graduating from our top post-secondary institutions each and every year. Speaker, can the minister please highlight any additional life science investments that have landed in this province recently? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Here yesterday, we joined Kenview in Guelph to announce the completion of their multi-million dollar facility expansion. Now, Kenview is the world's largest pure play health consumer product company. They make iconic products like Tylenol and Band-Aid, Listerine, Polysporin, all the things that you find in your drawer at home. They expanded their Guelph facility, bringing the size of their plant to more than 255,000 square feet, and that investment will allow them to ramp up their manufacturing capacity. Now, that investment will also add more good-paying jobs to the hundreds uh, of employees that Kenview already has in Guelph. Speaker, we've landed more than $5 billion in new life science investments, and there's much, much more to come. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Over the past six years, homelessness has surged and the shelters are full. There are now over 1,400 encampments in Ontario. The Conservatives could take responsibility and invest in affordable housing, but instead they're blaming everyone else for the problem. My question is simple, and it's to the Premier. When an encampment is cleared, where exactly do you expect people to go? Thank you. Thank you. Members, please take their seat. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, the member will uh, will appreciate that in her own riding, we have increased uh, funding for uh, the housing prevention program by, uh, by I think it's 28 percent in the member's own riding. We have an historic investment right now of over 1.2 billion dollars. Uh, uh, to help uh, us deal with the challenges that have been brought on by uh, uh, a really rapid expanding population uh, uh, in the province of Ontario. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, I think uh, the member is correct in one sense. Uh, we are investing records amount in the homelessness uh, prevention program across the province of Ontario. As I said, $1.2 billion dollars. It is our expectations that our municipal partners work with us, that our federal partners work with us so that we can deal with this challenge head on because ultimately, Mr. Speaker, it is the right thing to do to ensure that everybody has a roof over their head, that they have Response. access to the services that they need. And if our partners aren't going to get the job done, we will step in and make sure that we do get the job done. The supplementary question. Thank you. Back to the Premier. This government has had six years to address the homelessness crisis and it has never been worse. To end homelessness, people need a permanent, affordable home. But the Conservatives have essentially turned their back on affordable housing and the construction of affordable housing at a time when the government's own documents show there are 234,000 people facing homelessness. My question is to the Premier. When are the Conservatives going to take responsibility and address the homelessness crisis. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not sure what the member is talking about. The reality is that we've increased funding by over to $1.2 billion, record amount of funding in the province of Ontario to deal with the housing homelessness uh, prevention programs. Uh, Speaker, I know that the, minister, uh, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions is also working on the very real piece, uh, Speaker, that we see often in some of these encampments are mental health issues and addiction issues. So we're dealing with that at the same time. But we're also putting in resources. Look, Speaker, we were the ones that led the call for the federal government to eliminate the GST or the HST on purpose-built rentals. And what happened when we saw that happen? We reduced the tax and we saw record amounts of housing being built in the province of Ontario. When we brought forward a plan to eliminate development charges on affordable housing, that member and that party Spons. voted against that initiative, Mr. Speaker. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to continue to fund 
uh, housing across the province of Ontario, but it is our expectation that the funds that we are spending are going to see the results that Ontarians want, and if they don't, we'll step in and get the job done. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Transportation. Under the Premier's leadership, Ontario is a top choice for families and workers to live. People are coming here to build their careers and to start new lives. And that's something everyone should be proud of. As more people settle in Ontario, we must ensure that our transportation infrastructure keeps up with that growth. Speaker, sadly, the previous Liberal government left our province in gridlock crisis. Because they failed to act, commuting has become more difficult for everyone. That is why our government must commit to building and expanding our roads, highways and transit systems. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please outline the steps our government is taking to reduce gridlock and keep Ontario moving forward? I remind the House that uh, questions should be addressed to ministers even though parliamentary assistants are permitted to answer them. The member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to my colleague for the question. Speaker, our population is growing. We know that. And we need more infrastructure to support the families moving to our great province. Under this Premier's leadership, our government is focused on getting people out of gridlock. We have a plan to build new highways and public transit all across Ontario. Speaker, we are building historic projects that will support our growing population and make it easier for people to get where they need to go. As part of our plan, we're building critical projects like Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass. We are building the Ontario Line, a brand new subway in the largest city in the country. And for commuters who take the GO train, we're building new tracks and new stations to prepare for two-way, all-day GO service. Speaker, our government is building for the future. We're focused on tackling gridlock and keeping this province moving. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals do not have a transit plan. They keep saying no to investment that will keep our province moving. That's right. And the NDP are no better. That's right. Speaker, they don't believe in building new highways. They vote against funding more transit. They said no to the Ontario Line subway. Yes. And they voted against funding two-way, all-day go train service. That's correct. Speaker, we are the only ones under the leadership of Premier Ford with a plan to improve Ontario's transportation network. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please outline the progress our government is making to tackle gridlock? Thank you. Once again, I'll remind the, the members to address their comments to address their questions to ministers. The member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington, parliamentary system can reply. Speaker, and thank you to the member from scarborough Aiden Court. You're absolutely right. It's true. The Liberals and the NDP simply don't have a serious plan to tackle gridlock. What are their solutions, Speaker? They want to remove car lanes to add more bike lanes on our busiest roads. They want to tear down highways like the Gardner's Expressway. And the NDP want to use your money to give private trucking companies free tolls on the 407. Oh, wow. And, Speaker, we believe in building new infrastructure, Order. such as the toll-free Highway 413 and the electric two-way all-day GO service. Unlike the Liberals and the NDP, Speaker, we actually have a serious plan to address gridlock. And, Speaker, our government will get Ontario's moving and keep Ontarians moving. Thank you, Speaker. Great job. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Recently, I met Carolyn. She's a 79-year-old woman living in my community, and she was diagnosed with a stage 4 single prolapse bladder three years ago and is still waiting for critical surgery. While waiting to see specialists and for surgery, her condition has worsened to a double prolapse, greatly impacting her quality of life. She's forced to spend up to $180 on incontinence products out of her limited budget. Carolyn's story is heartbreaking, but not shocking to anyone anymore under this government who's only in it for themselves. Minister, what will this government do to help Carolyn get the surgery she needs and end her suffering? Member Essex and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, uh, the province of Ontario has a health care budget in 2018. That health care budget stood at $60 billion. Today, the same health care budget stands at $85 billion for a $25 billion increase, which is a 41% increase over the same period of time. That, at the same time, the province of Ontario has the number one best surgical times in the entire country better than any other province, better than British Columbia, better than Saskatchewan, better than New Brunswick. But we can always do better and we will always seek to do better. Mr. Speaker, we are expanding the community health clinics and the community health surgical centres to give more surgeries and more faster surgeries in the province of Ontario. Of Fons. course, we know the NDP don't support that plan, but we're going to go ahead with it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Speaker, Carolyn cannot wait on empty promises. She lives in constant discomfort and pain and is suffering mentally from an indignity that comes with a sensitive condition. She's been told it could take still up to another two years before she gets surgery. She was brave enough to come forward and share her story. Can the minister promise Carolyn she can get her surgery before her 80th birthday? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, any person in that situation, and including that dear constituent who needs to get that health care, should get that health care. And I want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that we're providing better health care in the province of Ontario through increasing surgical weight, uh, surgical uh, uh, activities and surgical opportunities through the surgical clinics that are being set up by an expansion that was undertaken, undertaken by this government. We know that the opposition didn't support that expansion, but we need that expansion to help constituents such as that dear lady who needs her surgery. Mr. Speaker, in Ontario, surgical times are faster than anywhere else in the, in the entire country. Order. We're doing better than every other province, but we always seek to do better and better so that we can help every constituent, including that dear lady, get her surgery. And that's why we've undertaken an expansion of the surgical clinics, which will Bons. offer better, uh, better experience and faster experience in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. While this Premier is busy distracting the public with booze, bike lanes and subterranean passages, 2.5 million Ontarians are being hung out to dry without family doctors. In his own riding of Etobicoke North, 32,000 people have no family doctor, no one to go to who knows their medical history and no one to go to when they're at their most vulnerable state, thanks to this government. Jennifer, one of my residents, is losing her family doctor after three decades, and as a senior, she is worried about being without a family physician who knows her diagnoses. Unfortunately for Jennifer and the other 2.5 million Ontarians without family doctors, this government is failing to retain and recruit health care professionals. Speaker, my question to the Premier, what are you saying to your 32,000 residents when they come to you asking for help to get a family doctor? He's not saying it. Members to make their comments through the chair. Member for Essex and Parliamentary Assistant Minister of Health. Speaker. Speaker, I feel for Jennifer because Jennifer needs primary care just like everybody else in the province of Ontario. And I feel for Jennifer, especially since the Liberal Party reduced the number of doctors being trained in Ontario when they formed the Liberal government. 
but we're not going to do what the Liberals did. We're not going to reduce the number of doctors being trained in the province of Ontario. In fact, we're training more doctors, not only in southern Ontario, but also in northern Order. Ontario as well. We're training more doctors than the Liberals ever trained, and we're going to make up for their mistakes, and we're going to make up for their failures, and we're going to connect... The member for Don Valley East will come to order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. Order. Stop the clock. Okay. Perhaps I need to speak more loudly. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. The Minister of Natural Resources will come to order. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. Okay. If you repeatedly ignore the requests of the Speaker to come to order, you will be warned, and the next stage, of course, is an early exit for the day, in case we forgot. Was there still any time left? Was there still any time left? There is time? Okay. How many seconds? No time? Okay. Supplementary question? Yep. Okay. Start the clock. The supplementary question, the member for Beaches East York. and lovely people in Essex who are without family doctors get help from this member. In my riding of beautiful Beaches East York, there are 23,000 people without a family doctor. I'm embarrassed that this government has done nothing to fix it in the past six years. My staff work hard to help the residents find physicians in our riding who are accepting patients. They call local clinics, they try to connect our constituents with the doctors. It's not easy. Meanwhile, this government created a digital map to help Ontarians find beer and wine in the area. Talk about skewed priorities. The 32,000 people in the Premier's riding of Etobicoke North need basic health care, not a six-pack. <laughs> the 23,000 in my riding of Beaches East York need a trusted family physician, not a box of wine. Question. So my question to the Mayor, sorry, I mean Premier. <laughs> Let the member pose her question. Member for Beaches East Shore. I'm sorry. My question to the Premier is when will the 2.5 million Ontarians without a family doctor finally get one? To reply, the, minister, the member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal member who just spoke has illustrated my point perfectly. I stated previously that when the Liberals calculate their statistics, they always talk about family doctors and they never include nurse practitioners. <laughs> nurse practitioners deliver primary care. Nurse practitioners deliver patient-focused care. Nurse practitioners believe in the team-based strategy, but that member three times referred to primary care and doctors and never once mentioned nurse practitioners. We believe in nurse practitioners. This party believes in nurse practitioners. Liberals do not believe in nurse practitioners. Maybe they should start believing Response. in nurse practitioners. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The next question. The member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. The people of Ontario, that our farmers are the backbone of this community. They work hard day in and day out to put food on our table. But right now, they're facing one of the toughest challenges yet. The Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is pushing them to financial brink and making it harder for them just to compete. It's driving up feed, fuel, fertilizer costs for their farm operations. 
Farmers across our province, especially in my riding, need to know that our government stands with them against this unfair and regressive tax. Speaker, can the ministry, minister share uh, what concerns he has heard from farmers about the harmful impact of the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax on their operations? The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. He's doing a great job. He's a great neighbour, representing farmers very, very well. Here, thank here. you, sir. Here, here. Earlier this year, Speaker, 25 leading agri-food, agribusinesses and farmers sent a letter to the federal government asking them to scrap the tax. Sadly, it went unresponded to and ignored. I want the House to hear some examples. The Grain Farmers of Ontario have described this tax as unbearable, estimating it will cost their members $2.7 billion by 2030. Wow. John De Bruin, past chair of Ontario Pork, has said it makes their sector less competitive in the global markets that they compete in. The Ontario Fruit and Vegetables Growers Association says it will cost their members $16 million last year alone. Sadly, the, sat the Carbon Tax Coalition opposite continues to support it. It's funds, it hurts our farmers, it hurts our food processors, it raises the price of groceries. Scrap the tax. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario farmers are facing tough economic times. Soaring costs are hitting them hard, from fuel to farm equipment and all the essentials needed to keep their operations running. The Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is making everything worse, adding costs every step of the way. Farmers have told us that this tax is making it harder and more expensive for them to do what they do best, feed Ontario. With everything going up, they're being forced to pass those costs on down to the consumers. The price of the tax isn't just felt on the farm. It is felt on every family's dinner table as well. But we know our government is stepping up to help. Speaker, can the minister please explain to how our government continues to stand up with our farmers and is providing them with help that they need? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Thank you, Speaker. Simply put, we're creating the environment for our farmers and food processors to succeed. What have we done to create this environment, you ask? We've lowered taxes, WSIB premiums. We raised the risk management program from 100 to $150 million. We secured $569 million through SCAP. We raised the feeder cattle loan program from $260,000 to $500 million to $500 million, Speaker. We continue to pave the way to help our farmers and food processors succeed. But what do the members opposite do? they support a carbon tax. It's punitive. If they really want to help the program, they want to help our farmers and food processors get on board, get away from this tax, from the, from the farm gate to the consumer's plate, axe this tax and axe it now. Here, here. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Um, you speaker. I'm in the Gajir Bayam. Speaker, uh, this government isn't uh, in for the municipalities in Northern Ontario. In northwestern Ontario, Red Lake, Dryden, Kenora, Ear Falls, Mashin, Ignace, and Pickle Lake all saw substantial rises in OPP costs. Pickle Lake's 315% um, increase amounts to $668 per property this year. Northern municipalities are sounding the alarm bells at the skyrocketing prices of policing. Will this government, will you provide them the re cost relief they are asking for? To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Mr. Speaker, the provincial government, our government led by Premier Ford, takes public safety very seriously all across Ontario. We are lucky to have the Ontario Provincial Police that for so long has taken care of public safety for approximately 75% of the land area of Ontario. Received 2 million calls last year, Mr. Speaker, and responded to over a million two calls. 
and we're never going to not listen to our municipality. We are always going to listen to them wherever they are in Ontario, and I have been in discussions throughout uh, AMO and presently with municipalities to make sure that their concerns are heard. And in the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, again, public safety is a priority for this government, and we will continue to listen to municipalities wherever they are in Ontario. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, Northern uh, municipalities are already facing housing crises, mental health crises, health care crises, and budgets are tight. They are warning that the result of increased policing costs will be cuts to other services and increases in taxes. Will this government listen to towns and help with the costs of policing so municipalities can keep their services and avoid extra tax increases? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I think the Premier has been very clear. We're going to continue to dialogue and to engage and to listen to the concerns of the municipalities. And in the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, people who serve in the OPP also deserve to be paid a fair wage. People, police officers across Ontario deserve to be paid fair wages, and we have here the President of the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police. We dialogue with organizations all the time. We will listen to our municipalities. We will continue to engage with them. We will be there for them. We will leave no one behind, Mr. Speaker, and we will always prioritize with a laser-focused approach public safety throughout our province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoula. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Over the summer, residents on Manitoulin Island were left stranded for long periods because the mechanical failures on the Little Current Swing Bridge. This happened several times over the summer with no notice and with little to no explanation from the ministry about what caused these delays. And there have been ongoing closures for maintenance and repairs. In this year's budget, the Minister of Finance specifically highlighted replacing the swing bridge as part of their plan. However, over the year later, we still have no idea how much the government is going to spend, the timeline for the project, or even when we'll get shovels in the ground. The swing bridge is the only year-round access point to Manitoulin Island. Minister, will you tell the people of Manitoulin when the new swing bridge will begin construction and when will it be completed? I am the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. That swing bridge is obviously very important uh, a project for us, and that's why it was featured in the budget, Mr. Speaker, as part of our $28 billion plan to build roads, bridges, and highways over the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker. And that is why we are committed to improving transportation infrastructure across this province. It's this government that has put forward the dollars to invest, knowing how important it is for that community. And we'll work through the prop process to make sure we get construction underway as soon as we can, Mr. Speaker. We'll design that uh, bridge and ensure that the people uh, across this province can use it and the residents as well can benefit from it because, Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to building in the north, building this entire province and investing in the necessary infrastructure to support Ontarians. Supplementary, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Again to the Minister, and again, there's still no answers coming from this government. People in rural and northern communities shouldn't be left in limbo when it comes to critical infrastructure. Replacing the Little Current Swing Bridge will be a massive undertaking. The lack of information and transparency from the government has people on Manitoulin worried about whether this project is being taken seriously by this government. When the bridge is closed unexpectedly for any amount of time, it affects people's ability to get to medical appointments, to work, to events, and it negatively impacts Manitoulin's ability to bring visitors and business to their community. Haw eaters are tired of hearing re-announcements after re-announcements from this government. They want to see concrete dollars allocated and action to the replacement project and a firm timeline for completion. 
question. Minister, all we want is a date. When will the new Lille Current Swing Bridge be built? The Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, we are very serious about building this bridge. That's why we featured it in our budget, Mr. Speaker, and that is why that member has an opportunity to support that budget. I know last year that member voted against that very document that featured the swing bridge, Mr. Speaker. In fact, he has another opportunity through the fall economic statement to support the continued construction and building of bridges across this province, including the swing bridge. So I would hope that that member stands up for his residents in the north, stands up for his community and especially that specific project, Swing Bridge, that he has mentioned himself, and votes to support the fall economic statement, which is in this legislature for debate and will be voted on. So I count, I'm hoping to count on that member's uh, support to ensure that we continue the process of getting that bridge under construction and built for the people in the community and for Response. those in the north who use it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Solicitor General. Community safety is a major concern for people across Ontario, especially in my riding of Markham Unionville. Every day, families worry about the safety of their neighbourhoods. They want to know that our government is doing everything it can to prevent crime before it happens. We know that safe communities aren't just about policing. <clears throat> they are about everyone working together, community groups, local leaders, and law enforcement. Crime Prevention Week highlights just how important it is for us to be aware and engaged. When everyone says plays a role, communities become more resilient and safer. Speaker, can the Solicitor General Please share what steps Jim. our government is taking to promote crime prevention and enhance community safety across Ontario. Well, thank you. The Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend. He's a great supporter of the York Regional Police Service that keeps his community safe each and every day. You know, Mr. Speaker, Crime Prevention Week is very important because we we talk about awareness, we talk about engagement and prevention of crime across our province. We are delighted to have the President of the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, Roger Wilkie, Deputy Chief of Halton, here today. Mr. Speaker, our government is acting. That's why we put almost 2,100, it'll be 2,100 new boots on the ground in the next 12 months. It's unprecedented. When I went back to speak to some of the older police officers, they said when they went to the Ontario Police College, class sizes were 40 and 50. Now they're 500 thanks to Premier Ford and the investments we've made. And Mr. Speaker, we're not stopping. Whether it's fighting auto theft, whether it's fighting to get the violent and repeat offenders off our street, this government will prioritize our public safety. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Every community in Ontario, whether big or small, deserves to feel safe. Here, here. Absolutely. People want to feel secure in their homes, on the streets, yep. and in their neighbourhoods. Crime prevention isn't just about stopping crime, it's about giving people the tools they need to protect themselves and their families. Our communities are stronger when people have the resources to stay safe, but we know that crime prevention doesn't look the same everywhere. That's why it's so vital that every Ontarian, regardless of where they live, has the same opportunities to benefit from these safety initiatives. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain how our government is helping to ensure these crime prevention resources reach all Ontarians, including those Question. in our most diverse and remote communities? Thank you, MPP Peng. Thank you. Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, again, thanks my uh, great friend from Markham Unionville. Mr. Speaker, our government has not stopped. 
We have a CCTV, a CCTV grant. We have an auto prevention grant. We have the bail compliance and warrant apprehension grant. We don't stop. But, Mr. Speaker, one has to ask the question. When the Associate Minister and I made the announcement last week on calling on the federal government to enact meaningful bail reform, where was Bonnie Crombie? She was hiding, just like she did with the carbon tax, uh -huh. not, not coming forward and saying when she she sat on the Peel Regional Police Service Board. She knew to the dollar the amount of carbon tax being wasted because Peel Police Service couldn't have more boots on the ground. They're paying the carbon tax. She is silent on public safety, and Ontarians know it. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Survivors of intimate partner violence have been telling this government that the court backlogs and delays created by their underfunding are denying survivors and victims of, of crime access to justice. The Premier's fall economic statement projects a half a billion dollar cut in next year's spending on the justice system, falling from $6.2 billion to $5.7 billion. In Ontario, we have seen legitimate cases cases being thrown out. This is due to unconstitutional court delays. We've seen rapists and human traffickers walk free because this government chooses to look the other way. Why is this government speaker cutting justice spending by 9% when survivors are still not getting their day in court? Reply, the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, that, that member could not be more wrong, Mr. Speaker. The investments that we're making in modernizing the justice system and arming the justice system to do its job, Mr. Speaker, we added more judges this year than any time in the history of the province in a group. Mr. Speaker, we are adding the resources in the capital of buildings, Mr. Speaker. We're adding the resources in the support structure, it, hiring Crown prosecutors, victim services, Mr. Speaker, court clerks. We've made full-time opportunities for court clerks who were previously in more tenuous employment, Mr. Speaker. We're adding technology, Mr. Speaker. But here's the only theme to all of that, Mr. Speaker. We are doing that in spite of the opposition and them voting against us at at every single stage. Order the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. A half a billion dollars in cuts and all we get are canned talking points. This government has insulted survivors and families who are mourning lost daughters who were killed through intimate partner violence. The House has heard loud and clear, Speaker, from courageous survivors like Kate Alexander, who was nearly beaten to death by her former boyfriend. This House has also heard from Emily Agar, who was raped, who actually testified in her case. But the clock ran out, and her case was thrown after she began her testimony. Both of these people have now walked. The, the abuser as well as the rapist have now free on our street because of this government. This government refuses every opportunity to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. They're letting rapists and abusers walk free. Speaker, why does this government have such disdain for survivors and victims of sexual assault? Who are they actually? protecting members will please take their seat to respond the, the associate minister of women's social and economic opportunity thank you mr speaker we just heard uh, our, our member, um, the Minister of our Attorney General, just speak about the investments that we're making to ensure that our victims have their day in court. But, Mr. Speaker, one of the other Mr. things that our government has actually done, where the members' office that have been silent, is calling on the federal government for mandatory remands for perpetrators of intimate partner violence. So we will. <laughs> Those are the steps that are actually going to ensure that perpetrators are held accountable and make sure that women are free to be feel safe in our streets. But Mr. Speaker, we're also making sure that we're investing in the services 
that women can access if they are assaulted, Mr. Speaker, because we believe that every single woman is the heart of their family, their community, <laughs> and nobody, Order. no woman should ever Fonts. feel like they are a threat of their own life and their own safety. So investing in our shelters, investing in supports that help women in cross community. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener, South Hespler. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Gaming. Um, film and television production has been a big success story across our province, um, especially in my own area. I'm from Cambridge, and uh, we've had The Handmaid's Tale is uh, largely filmed there, uh, as was The Queen's Gambit, uh, Reacher on Amazon, and uh, notably, uh, Once Upon a Time, Murdoch Mysteries was filmed at my own house, where it involved, I think, somebody falling out of a, the tower and dying. Um, anyway, a lot of filming going on in, uh, in beautiful Cambridge, uh, but obviously there's a lot of other jurisdictions that are competing to try to bring uh, film and TV to those respective areas as well. Um, so we obviously have to continue supporting this industry. Can you talk more, Minister, uh, about what our government is doing to promote and cultivate the expansion of on-screen based industries in Ontario? The Minister of Tourism, Culture and Gaming. I certainly can speak. In fact, the member mentions a few amazing shows, but that's not the end of the list. Mm -hmm. The Umbrella Academy, Shorzy, Letterkenny, Suits, Ginny and Georgia, also all filmed right here in Ontario. And Speaker, it's because of our government's investment into this industry, which has generated approximately $1.8 billion in spending and created almost 26,000 jobs. That's why in our budget, 2024, we invested more than $1 billion to support Ontario's screen-based industry tax credits, which include Ontario Film and Television Tax Credit, Ontario Production Services Tax Credit, Ontario Computer Animation, and special effects tax credit, Ontario Interactive Digital Media Tax Credit. This commitment is helping the industry, and I know the previous Liberal government left the industry up Schitt's Creek with no paddle, but this government is saying light camera action on film in Ontario. That's right. Supplementary. Um, while uh, the minister references a number of other uh, wonderful productions that have happened in Ontario, as the one asking the question, I'm going to bring it right back to Cambridge again. Um, as I said, the, uh, the Handmaid's Tale, Gilead, is largely filmed in Cambridge. Um, and one particularly notable scene during the riots and the protesting uh, involved one of my favorite local coffee shops, the Grand Cafe, uh, actually having all of its windows blown out. Um, which is quite something to see in your uh, safe local jurisdiction. Um, obviously, uh, I don't think that you could replicate Gilead in any other place uh, outside of Cambridge, but uh, other jurisdictions are trying to enhance their own landmark attractions to a considerable extent. Could the minister elaborate on specific initiatives that our government is undertaking to showcase this industry across the province? The minister. Why, yes, I can, Speaker. Another great question from the member. In fact, we are investing into the industry in a variety of ways, not least of which is $19.5 million to support festivals and events across Ontario. Now, I'm not sure why the Liberals are heckling. Maybe it's because they voted against all of these measures, and it's hard to hear all the economic activity that's spun off of this industry. But we won't leave the film industry in the dark, Speaker. We're going to continue to invest in them, whether it's the Windsor International Film Festival, the Toronto International Film Festival, or most recently, the Forest City Film Festival. This government is saying lights, camera, action in Ontario. We're here to stay. Let's see it thrive and grow. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. There are four members who have informed me they have a point of order they wish to raise. We'll start with the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, on a point of order, I would like to just say that as of last night, there is a newly elected city councillor in Ward 15, my riding of Don Valley West. I would like to congratulate Rachel Chernos Lynn and her team on a very successful campaign and wish her all the best at City Hall. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much. I just, uh, I know it's been busy and loud in here today and that everybody's heading to caucus, but I wanted to let everybody know that right after question period, Dr. Shamji and I will be in our desk, and if you want to know how many people in your riding don't have a family doctor, we'll stay here as long as it takes. 
not a valid point of order. The member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to remind all members in the House that there is a flu clinic taking place in the Legislative Library today until 3 o'clock. This is an excellent opportunity to get a flu shot if you don't have a family doctor. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Well, thank you, Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome my wife, Denise, who is up in the gallery. Welcome to Queen's Park. <laughs> Being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess 